shine in my soul today. More glorious and bright than glows in any early skies. For Jesus is my light. Oh, there is sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is music in my soul today. A carol to my King, and Jesus listening can hear the songs I cannot sing. Oh, there is sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is spring and when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. Because there is sunshine in our soul, we will wait the song of joy and gladness. Number 34. With the song of joy and gladness, in the brilliant of last place, banish every thought of sadness, pouring forth your highest praise. Sing to him whose care has brought us once again with friends to meet. And whose loving voice has taught us of the way to Jesus' feet. Wait the song, wait the song, wait the song, wait the song, the song of joy and gladness. Wait the song, wait the song, wait the song, the song of jubilee. Joyfully with songs and banners, we will greet the festal day. Shout aloud our glad or sadness, and our grateful homage play. We will chant our Savior's glory, while our thoughts we raise above. Telling still the old love story, precious team redeeming love. Wait the song, wait the song, the song, the song of joy and gladness. Wake the song, wake the song, wake the song, the song of jubilee. Thanks to thee, O Holy Father, for the mercies of the year. May each heart as here we gather, swear with gratitude sincere. Thanks to thee, O loving Savior, for redemption through thy blood. Breathe upon us, Holy Spirit, sweetly draw us near to God. Wake the song, wake the song, the song of joy and gladness. Wake the song, wake the song, the song of jubilee. Praise the Lord. 3, 381, Holy Sabbath day of rest. 381. Holy Sabbath.
never tell your friends. By a master richly blessed, God created and divine, set aside for all the time. Yes, the only Sabbath rest. By a God divinely blessed, it to us a sign shall be throughout all eternity. See not pleasures of this earth with its folly, noise, and mirth. There are better things in store. Over on the other shore, yes, the holy Sabbath rest. By your God divinely blessed, it to us a sign shall be throughout all eternity. As the Sabbath joy at all. Friday Eve at set of sun, Christian also then should meet, sing and pray at Jesus' feet. Yes, the holy Sabbath rest, by your God divinely blessed, it to us a sign shall be. Throughout all eternity, asking him for saving grace, also victory in the race, and to help us by his power to keep holy every hour. Yes. The Holy Sabbath rest by your God divinely blessed. It to us a sign shall be throughout all eternity. 384, safely through another week. Indeed, God has brought us on our way. 384. 384. Safely through another week, God has brought us on our way. Let us now a blessing seek, waiting in His courts today. They are for the week the best, emblem of eternal rest. They are for the with the best, emblem of eternal rest. While we seek supplies of grace, through the day, Redeemer's name, show the reconciling face, take away our sin and shame. From our worldly care set free, May we rest this day in thee, from our worldly care set free. May we rest this day in thee. When the morn shall bid us rise, may we feel thy presence near. May thy glory be eyes while we in thine house appear. Air afford us, Lord, a taste of our everlasting feast. Air afford us, Lord, a taste of our everlasting feast. May the gospel joyful sound conquer sinners, comfort saints. May the fruits of grace abound. Bring relief to all complaints. Thus may all our Sabbaths be till we rise to reign with thee. 
Thus may all our Sabbaths be Till we rise to reign with thee Praise the Lord This has brought us to the end of our song service At this time we'll stand and sing our team song 361 Arct is the shepherd voice I hear 361 Hark, tis the shepherd voice I hear. Out in the desert, dark and drear, calling the sheep who've gone astray. Far from the shepherd's fold away, bring them in, bring them in, bring them in from the fields of sin. Bring them in, bring them in, bring the wanderers to Jesus. Who go and help the shepherd kind, helping the wandering ones to find. Who bring them back into the fold, where they be sheltered from the cold. Bring them in, bring them in, bring them in from the fields of sin. Bring them in, bring them in, bring the wanderers to Jesus. Out in the desert, hear their cry. Out on the mountain, wild and die. Hark, teach the master, speak to thee. Go find my sheep where they be. Bring them in, bring them in. Bring them in from the fields of sin. Bring them in, bring them in, bring the wanderers to Jesus. Praise the Lord. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Our scripture reading is coming from Philippians 2, 5 to 11. And it reads thus. You should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had, who though he existed in the form of God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by looking like other men and by sharing in human nature. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As a result, God highly exalted him and gave him this name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of the God, of God the Father. Let us pray. Oh, Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, we come to you this morning to thank you and give you praise and to worship with each other this morning. We ask, oh God, for your blessing on those in the sanctuary, those online, and those to come. And may this day be one big catarumpus time, oh God, in Zion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May be seated. Now, um, 
for this morning's dissertation. This is coming from our own literature. This is coming from the book called Inverse, Quarterly, where, for our young adults. And to show that we, don't, we are not short as Adventists for literature to read. You understand? And this topic is, is, is entitled Foundations of Discipleship. And this section is denial of self. Now, while we battle over whether we should use our human capabilities for selfish desires, Christ was also tempted to use his divine capabilities for self. The same, but totally different as well. Hebrews 14, 15 declares, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Some assert that Jesus was tempted literally in every way that every human being has ever been tempted. In some part of Christ's life that was unrecorded by the gospel narratives, Jesus was tempted with marijuana, and I like to, and I, people with nuclear radiation, or killing people with nuclear radiation, internet pornography, drug trafficking, and so on. On the other hand, someday that this idea is preposterous and that Christ was tempted only in three ways as recording Matthew 4 and Luke 4. They are first that Christ was tempted in his own particular way, his own trial, and though he had the victory, this has no bearing on you and me today. The former idea makes Jesus into some mega deranged and abased human, while the latter pushes him away into the ethereal realm or the unreal realm as merely a historical character with no human quality at all. All. Philippians 2 presents the solution to this tension. Originally meant to resolve an internal Philippian church dispute, it is what Paul writes about the self denial and humility of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, verse 5. Jesus was God and fully divine. But he humbled himself to not only become a human being, but also to suffer a big word, which is terrible, terrible death, as a human being. Paul emphasized that Christ died the death of the cross, a manner of execution for the lowest of classes. Let's put this into plainer language. As in the... the Christ was in all points tempted as we are, but in a different way, because he was a divine model of a car. When we are tempted with intemperance, we have to decide whether we are going to eat the object in front of us or not. Adam and Eve in the garden. But when Christ was tempted, he had to decide whether he was going to use his creative power to rearrange the atoms of stones into edible bread. That's just one way of thinking about it. Perhaps instead he was tempted to eliminate, eliminate the hunger hormones in his body. Perhaps eliminate the concept of food. Perhaps even reorient the universe so that the notion of consumption and necessity were themselves eliminated. Who knows? The extent of temptation when experienced by divinity. Because Christ overcame, God also highly exalted him and given him the, say, the name which is above every name. Philippians 2 verse 9. On this basis, Christ's followers are to partake in this name to humble and deny self for the larger good. In the case of the Philippians, it was a call for two women to get along. Philippians 4 verse 2, and have the same mind. 
In the case of Christ's disciples of the 21st century, how will the mind of Christ be manifest in our lives? And that is a question to the church. In the case of Christ's disciples of the 21st century, how will the mind of Christ be manifest in our lives? Anyone? Let me read it again, slowly. Christ and followers are to partake in his name to humble and deny self for the larger good. In the case of the Philippians, it was a call for two women to get along. And they had to have the same mind. In the case of Christ's disciples of the 21st century, how will the mind of Christ be manifest in our lives? Question to the church. All right. Basically, to know what we are talking about to compare, I'm going to read. Okay. Go ahead. That is one out of the way. Um, Christ, if we have the mind of Christ, we would study the word of God. That is one um, way. Christ also prayed. He went, he went up into the mountain very early in the morning and prayed. We don't really have to literally go to mountain, but we can have a mountain top experience in the morning before day with him. You know, those are the mind of Christ. Reading the word, praying. Um, Christ mingle with people. He, um, he meet their needs. He spoke to them. Find out, you know, their needs and so on. And he win them over. So, you know, um, if we have the mind of Christ, we would uh, emulate um, Christ's character. Just like um, in Antias. I think it says that there was, I don't know if I'm, sir, if I'm right, but I believe there's, there was where persons get the nickname Christians because they were Christ-like. Okay, thank you. Let me read a little, of, um, before I come to you, let me read a little of Philippians 4 um, for you so you probably will uh, match up to what I'm talking about. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Eodius and beseech Sintesh that they be of the same mind in the Lord. That is verse 2. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. That is basically what I was talking about. Now, uh, my brother, you can Happy, say what you were saying. All right, good morning. Happy Sabbath. Um, to have the mind of Christ. All right, the Bible says, let this mind be in in Christ Jesus. Amen. And this mind of Christ is anti-world, anti-self, and it's all about serving God. So therefore, the mind of Christ is to submit his will to the Father is to walk in his father's commandment and to share his father's will, commandments to the rest of the world. So should, for, for me as a Christian, my life to be submitted to Christ, my character is supposed to be the, the character of Christ, is to do my father's will. So this man that I have is a will of two things, serve God and serve humanity in love. Amen. He's, they are both, we are both correct. Luke 14, 26, Christ says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. At first glance, this sounds harsh, and certainly it is a radical statement. Right? 
So my question is to the class, what do you really think God was speaking or Christ was saying here in Luke 14, 26? In essence, forsake all others for the better good of heaven. In, in, in other words, you cannot serve mammon and God. You have to make a choice. And another thing said, there will be no respect of person. That means you must preach the gospel in all fairness, honesty, and openness without who the person may be. So then, what Christ is saying to us as individual, whatsoever will stop us from coming to him, we must willingly put it aside for the better good. So whatever it is itself, whatever it is um, self-gratification, or um, luxury of the world, and I say your job, your education, your, your richness, whatever it may be that you treasure more, he asks of you to, to put that aside and worship him in spirit and truth. Amen. But isn't that in some cultures extremely hard to do? Because remember, some cultures value families, you know. I mean, families above everything, <laughs> right? Um, so, the, um, some cultures you have even the grandmother who is the matriarch of the family. And whatever grandma says, goes. So, wouldn't you, some, in some cultures find that hard, for them hard to do? But um, I, I, I want to pose a question to you, though. Um, it come to us today in church because some of us still believe that whatever the pastor say is gospel. Whatever general conference say or each Jamaica conference say is gospel. So the question comes, should you, should, you, should, you, should you stick with the word of God or should you stick with general conference say? Do you love, as, do you love your pastor more than the word of God? So though you say the grandmother in some, in some culture, family is more important, but does God is more important than them? That is a key question. It's a job. Yeah, for example, we ask, we ask our brothers and sisters to go out and witness. Them find every, every, every situation to complain not to go. We are fasting tomorrow. Check how much persons coming tomorrow. Them tired, them all have everything to do. But if them boss asks them to come work tomorrow, them put on housework and everything and gonna work. So this is the question, where does your treasures lie? Where does your sincerity lies? Where does the allegiance lies? And that's a personal question for us this morning. Okay. Uh, that is more of a retroactive question than one to be answered. So we all have to, to, to reflect, inflect, and think about that question of how we are going to approach it. Okay? My sister? Okay. Um, it's not easy. But if we deny ourselves, if we give up everything, you know, when Christianity becomes hard, is when we don't want to fully surrender. And if our heart is fully surrender, you know, I've heard many cases, even some of the, um, the um, testimony readings from Sabbath school, where persons had to, you know, give up their family, give up certain belief. Um, to serve God. You know, I was working in a crusade and this young man, his mother was a thief and she brought him up in, the, in it. They used to scam people and everything. And the crusade came and he heard the word of God and he decided, you know, to give his heart to God. And his mother said, him can't stay in our house. He must go come out. And he made up his mind. He made up his mind and he gave his heart to God. The church had to find a place for him and everything because he recognized through the word of God that what his mother, his mother's lifestyle was wrong. So, you know, it's never easy, but if we truly believe in God, we will step out and God will help us. Amen. That is an example of if we stand up for God, God will stand up for us. No, um... At first glance, it sounds harsh, and certainly it is a radical statement. In many cultures, relationships with parents, spouse, siblings, and family are paramount. But rather than the modern connotation of hate, the original Greek word, misio, 
denotes loving less and placing lesser value. In other words, following Jesus is not just an addendum to your life, meaning um, something that you do in addition to, what, to your everyday things, right? It is saying that it is a complete re-evaluation and transformation of it. Relationships are completely rearranged so that Christ is at the center and all relationships stem from that primary one. The beautiful thing is that in keeping Christ as the center, we allow him to be the means by which the relationship is preserved. Okay? Not only in relationships, but also in our personal lives, we are to subjugate and surrender our entire being to Christ as our master. He continues, Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. It reminds us of Luke 9.23, where Jesus said similarly, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. In this statement, Jesus may have been foreshadowing the death he was going to die. Moreover, he was calling his disciples to be willing to die, not only physically, but also dying to self for him. This cannot be done by our own human strength, but in a discipleship relationship with him. It will happen. Christ acknowledges that this is such a radical call, it warrants some thinking and preparation. Hence, he mentions the need to count the costs before accepting the call. And at this time, we're going to um, pause to go into our various classes for lessons review um, at 10, 10 to 10. And then we'll come, we'll come back at 10, at 10.30 to finish up the dissertation. Teachers, stand. All right. Use me, Lord. Use me for thy service. Use me, Lord. Let me tell the story. There's no other way by which we can repay. So use me, use me, Lord. Okay. We're going to do the shepherding time now. And then we come back at 10.30. Hello, family. We're so glad that you tuned in for another edition of 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. I'm Jill Morricone. We're studying The Great Controversy, which is an incredible book written by Ellen White. But we're also studying The Great Controversy as we see it from heaven with Lucifer's rebellion all the way down to the earth made new, the final eradication of sin and God's way wins. We read the back of the book and we know that. Mm -hmm. This lesson, lesson two, is the central issue, love or selfishness. If you want a copy of our notes, we email them every week. And if you've already subscribed, you don't have to subscribe again. But if this is the first time you're hearing about it, you can email us at ssp at 3abn.org. That's ssp at 3abn.org. And we'd love to give you a copy of the notes just as we prepare them. I want to introduce my family, your family today. To my left, Pastor John Loma King. Glad you're here. Yes, this is an exciting quarterly, the great controversy. So I'm glad to be a part of the panel. Amen. And what are you studying on your day? On well, mine is Christians Providentially Preserved. Amen. In the middle, Ryan Day. Amen. I have Tuesday's lesson entitled Faithful Amid 
persecution. Wonderful. To your left, uh, Pastor John Denzi. Thank you. It's a blessing to be here. I have a very important lesson for Wednesday, caring for the community. Mm. Last but not least, Professor Daniel Perrin. Glad Thank you. you. I've got Thursday's lesson, A Legacy of Love. Mm. Amen. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. And Daniel, would you pray for us? Our loving Heavenly Father, Lord, only by your grace can we understand the character of God and only by your grace can we have that implanted in us mm -hmm. to be like you. Lord, as we study today, uh, we open up our hearts and we ask you to fill us, teach our minds, teach us to live and to love like you do. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. The central issue, love or selfishness? Ryan asked a question as we started last week's lesson, which we're gonna start this week's lesson with. Where is God? in pain. Where is God in the midst of suffering? If you've ever studied the Holocaust, which occurred not that long ago, you discover that six million Jews were killed, murdered during that time. One million alone in the concentration camp of Auschwitz-Birkenau. One million people in just a short span of time. Where is God in the midst of pain? This week, we're going to look a little bit at the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And we'll see the starvation that took place with the people there when it was under siege. And then the people who were killed by the general when he came in. Where is God in the midst of that pain? We'll also discover that not one Christian lost their life during that siege. We're going to look at the persecution of the early Christian church and we'll discover that some of those Christians were martyred for their faith. They were not spared. We see how the gospel is going to be spread through that persecution and the love that the early Christian church had for others and for God that carried them through some very painful and difficult times. We're gonna discover this week the power of love. Jesus' love for his people, even though they rejected him. We're gonna see that under persecution, it didn't deter God's people because they loved him supremely. And we'll see the early Christian church's love for other people for others in the church and those who were not even in the church. Our memory text is Isaiah 41, verse 10, and you probably know this verse. Isaiah 41, 10, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. I will help you, I will strengthen you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. On Sunday's lesson, we look at a broken hearted savior. And we're going to see the love of God for his people who had rejected him. We're going to look at two passages. Um, the, this is the triumphal entry. This is Passover week right before the crucifixion. And we're going to go to Luke 19 first. So turn with me to Luke 19. We're also going to look at it from Matthew 23. Luke 19. And we see Jesus on this young male donkey beginning the descent on the Mount of Olives. And there's people waving palm branches and singing, Hosanna to the King. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. And they're uh, giving him accolades and thinking, oh, wow, look, Jesus is here, the Messiah. Now, they had no concept of his true mission and that he's about ready to be crucified. Now, in the midst of all this, we see in Luke 19, verse 41, as he, that's Jesus, drew near, he saw the city and he rejoiced. Is that what it says? Mm -hmm. He wept over it. Now, he's not weeping because of his coming crucifixion. He's not weeping for himself. He's sad because his own people, God's chosen people, the people he came to save, they're going to reject him and they're going to go their own way. It's interesting to me, if you read the Old Testament, Israel is likened to a vine. You can find that in several different mm -hmm. passages. We found this in Psalm verse 80, where God says, you've brought a vine out of Egypt. In other words, Israel, God's chosen people were pulled out of a land of oppression and they were brought into this land of milk and honey. He wanted to care for his people. And what happened? Jeremiah 2 verse 21 tells us what happened to that vine. You planted a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. How then? 
have you turned before me into a degenerate plant of an alien vine? Hmm. God's people disobeyed him. God's people had turned away from him. You could say the vineyard, it went bad. Wow. You also see in Isaiah 5, God planting the vineyard and watering it and wanting to take care of his people. And time and time again, them turning their back on God. So when God, when Jesus is here looking over the city, he sees the impending destruction of Jerusalem coming in AD 70. He sees that the people, his people, God's chosen people are gonna reject him and are turning their back as a nation against him. Now that doesn't mean individual people can't be saved. Of course they can, right. but as a nation turning their back on him. John 1 11, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Let's keep reading. We're in Luke 19 verse 42. He wept over the city saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Mm -hmm. He brought the gospel to them and they refused him. For days will come upon you when your enemies, this is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem coming, will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave you in one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Hmm. We see the parallel passage from Matthew and I wanna turn there now. We're going to Matthew chapter 23. We see this parallel passage. Jesus again, weeping over his people. And I see in my mind's eye as I read this passage, three stages, Pastor John, for the Jerusalem and Israel in this passage. Number one, they rejected counsel in the past. Mm -hmm. hmm. We're in Matthew 23, verse 37. They rejected counsel in the past. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. God's people had been stiff-necked and stubborn. Hey. There's a five-fold cycle of obedience as we look at the sins in the past and how the people had refused to turn to God. If you look at Nehemiah chapter 9, you see this five-fold cycle of disobedience. We won't turn there, but you can study it. And it cycles through at least three times in Nehemiah chapter 9. You see the people disobeyed. And whatever it says in the Word of God, sometimes it says they're stiff necked Sometimes it says they disobeyed. Sometimes they turned away from him. They went to idols. That's step number one. Number two comes judgment. God sends judgment on his people. Why? Because he wants them to repent. He wants them to turn back to him in obedience because mm -hmm. he's a God of love. And he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So after judgment comes repentance. And you see this happen with the children of Israel. The nations around came in against them and they were oppressed. And then they cried out to God in their time of need. They repented. And the last two, mercy and deliverance went forth. God showed mercy. He forgave them. He cleansed them and he delivered them from their enemies. Right. And we see this happen over and over. But as soon as the land had Rest, the word of God says, as soon as things got easy and pleasant, they disobeyed again and they turned their back on God again. He sent judgment again. One of the stronger judgments would be, of course, the Babylonian captivity. 70 years they were oppressed, 70 years in a foreign country and nation. Why? Because they had turned their back on God. But this judgment was not a judgment to annihilate them. It was a corrective discipline. Right. He wanted to show mercy. He wanted to deliver them. And after the 70 years they were delivered, but we get down to Jesus time and he's saying, here, number one, you rejected my counsel in the past. How many times in the past did the prophets come to you and you killed them? You stoned them. You would not repent. And now we see number two, they refused Christ's entreaty today. It's not just the past, the present they refused him. How often, we're in Matthew 23, 37, I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Hmm. Him coming in person didn't change their minds. The prophets came, 
and they refused. They repented in pockets, and then they turned again to disobedience. Him coming in person, they refused. They're about ready to kill him. We come to number three, retribution is coming. Judgment is coming. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. The divine protection would be removed. The people would suffer terribly. Tens of thousands would die as the Roman general Titus led the armies against the city. Men and women and little children would be slaughtered. So you might say, where is God? His heart was broken. His eyes were filled with tears. For centuries, he had pleaded with his people. The lesson has this statement I love. By their rebellion against his loving kindness, they forfeited divine protection. God does not always intervene to limit the results of people's choices. Mm -hmm. And here we see in a, in a case for those people, the nation of Israel coming soon in AD 70, we see the divine protection being removed and the end results of the choices that they had made. Isaiah 5 verse 4, God speaking, what more could I have done to my vineyard? that I haven't done already. So to me, when we look at the destruction of Jerusalem, we see a picture, as it were, of what's gonna happen at the end of time. God bears long with his people and he loves us, but at some point, when all will have made their choice, either for or against God, that divine protection will be removed and we see judgment as a result. While there is yet time, choose love. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jill, for laying such a wonderful foundation. I am on Monday entitled Christians Providentially Preserved. My wife and I fly quite a bit and we have more than a million miles, I think over the years, a kind of extended note to about the two million mark, but something that came to my mind, whenever we take off, it doesn't matter what the airline is. It could be very, very small, local or a very extensive airline, they always talk about emergency measures because they've said emergency measures becomes the single most important focus in times of tragedy. And the NTSB always looks for the black box to find out the reason why things went so tragically wrong. Well, we look at the world today and we look at the decline of humanity and we could look at God's black book to find out the reasons why things went so tragically wrong. And it will always give us information describing exactly what happened in the fall of humanity. The good news is in the fall of humanity, we are still providentially preserved by Christ who understands our weaknesses, our frailties. And we find in Psalm 46 and verse one to three, this, this uh, emergency measure that we can always know is there. In the tailspin of life, by God's grace, we can always correct our attitude. And that's really flight language. But notice what the Bible says in Psalm 46, verses one to three. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. He's saying, but I'm still there. He's my ever present help in time of need. I read a story recently, a very tragic story of a lady who became a very well-known YouTuber. She would always chronicle her flights that she took. And uh, more recently, just about a year ago, she met in a tragic accident that took her life and her father's life. Mm -hmm. And uh, they tried to analyze so many pilots, so many people that are in the aviation industry decided to analyze because she put GoPro cameras in the cockpit and those cameras were recovered to see exactly what she did wrong. They said she was more interested and this is not a judgment call, but this is what they had concluded. She was very uh, concerned in popularity, but was not familiar with her plane and made judgment calls in critical moments that ultimately ended in the tragedy of her life and her father's life. And sometimes I think about how much we are more concerned about being familiar, becoming familiar with God's instrument than the popularity that it brings. And his Lord is in essence saying to us, focus on all of the things I've made available to you that in your walk with me, you can have a life that is safe. And so when we think about living from the day to day, which is where we all live, 
the day to day of your life, whatever decisions you're making, there is no need to fear if you simply, and I like the way that pilots have told me this, I was sitting next to a pilot that had flown for more than 32 years and come to find out we're different uh, belief systems, but he said something significant. I said, how well do you know the Boeing 777? He says, it doesn't matter how well I know it, I always use my flight checklist. Mm. And you know, there are Christians that live from day to day. They don't use their checklist. Mm. They don't look at their lives through the window of God's word. And pilots and passengers have this unbroken commitment by the NTSB. Don't leave the ground until you have gone through the checklist. And there's a co-pilot to make sure that the pilot and the co-pilot live by the checklist. Mm -hmm. How many of you are living by the checklist, by God's checklist? If you are, you can embrace this promise, Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right arm. So I have four actual observations about what happens when we look at God's providential pres preservation of every one of, us on a, every one of us on a daily basis. The first one is God is sovereign. God rules over the plotting of man against his children. God rules over the plotting of the enemy against his children. And in all situations, God has the final say. God determines the outcome based on his foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. What is foreknowledge? Based on knowledge. How do you compare the two? If you stood on the corner of a tall building and you saw two cars streaming toward the intersection and there was no stop sign, you know you have foreknowledge that something tragic is about to happen. You haven't programmed it. You can't prevent it, but you have the foreknowledge. God sees us in the realm and the flow of life, and he knows based on the decisions we make, based on the intersections of our lives, based on the unseen enemy, he knows what's going to take place and he preempts it by his goodness. And I can't tell you how many times my wife and I have said, these two words, but God. Mm. It could have been much worse, but yes, God. Right. And sometimes God allows the lesser evil to prevent the greater evil. Mm -hmm. So God is sovereign. What does he say in Luke 8 and verse 17? Here's God's sovereignty. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. God sees it all. He's never in the dark. Also Psalm 62 and verse 6. David says, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. That's the providential promise. If you trust in God, there's nobody that can move you. Nobody, nobody financially, economically, socially, spiritually, in no capacity of your life can you be moved when God is your rock. First, God is sovereign. Secondly, God is preemptive. Nothing passes to God's children without God's permission. People ask, why did that happen? Let me share a quotation with you and I'll come back to the other two points. Because many of us want to be Christians, but sometimes we wonder why do things happen? And in Ministry of Healing, page 470 and 471, this is an amazing quote. I'll try to get through it in the time I have. Speaking about us, they pray for Christ-likeness of character, for a fitness for the Lord's work, and they are placed in circumstances that seem to call forth all the evil of their nature. How does that happen? Faults are revealed of which they did not even suspect the existence. And like Israel of old, they question, if God is leading us, why do all these things come to us? But here's what Ellen White says. It is because God is leading them that these things come upon them. Trials and obstacles are the Lord's chosen methods of discipline and his appointed conditions of success. He who reads the hearts of men knows their character better than they themselves know them. He sees that some have powers and susceptibilities which, rightly directed, might be used in the advancement of his work. But listen to this. In his providence, he brings these persons that he can use into different positions and varied circumstances that they may discover in their character the defects which have been concealed from their own knowledge. That's God's foreknowledge. He then gives them opportunity to correct these defects and to fit themselves for his service. Often he permits the fires of affliction to assail them that they may be purified. God's foreknowledge. He says, you can be better than that. I need to get you into a furnace today. But he doesn't let you get consumed there. He purifies you there. Right. So the furnace of affliction is not for consummation, but for purification, which now takes us to the third point. God is our intermediary. 
I pointed out God is preemptive. Romans 8, 28, we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. How many things? All. all things. It doesn't matter. God never allows anything to come unless he knows it's going to be for our growth. God is also our intermediary. Nothing gets between God and his children. I love the prayer that was prayed in Genesis 31, verse 49. May the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from another. There is never a time that God is not watching between you and your co-workers, between you and your spouse, between you and your children. But here's the key. When you put God first and foremost and front and center in your life, you're not looking for the, the oxygen mask. You know where it is. You're not looking for the flotation vest. You've been told where it is. When you know where God's word is on a day-by-day -day basis, in emergencies, there really is no crisis because he is always present. Then not, not, not only that, if you're not even awake, God is our sentinel. God keeps watch over his children. Psalm 34, verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but what is God's part? But the Lord delivers him out of them all. Are you struggling and wondering when God is going to deliver you? Don't put God on the timetable. The promise is not time sensitive. It is, it is focused on the assurance, the blessed assurance that comes only through divine intervention. He will deliver you. Let God choose the timing. In Psalms 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. So what's the point? God is sovereign and overrules events on earth for the ultimate accomplishment of his divine purpose. Secondly, although at times God alters his original plans based on our human choices, his ultimate plan for this planet will be fulfilled. Thirdly, there will be Times when the people of God experience hardship, persecution, imprisonment, and death itself for the cause of Christ. But finally, but even in the most challenging of times with Satan's most vicious attacks, God sustains and preserves his church. Trust God. He is always providentially delivering you. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John. God is always love. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back to our study on the central issue, love or selfishness. We're going to turn it over to Ryan Day on Tuesday's lesson. Amen. I'm Ryan Day. I have Tuesday's lesson entitled Faith Amid Persecution. And I'm so excited that I got this lesson because it was very encouraging just to revisit the power of what the gospel can do in people's lives to make them so faithful even through the persecution that not might come, not could come, but as the Bible says, will absolutely come. And it's, it's important. in people's lives to make them so faithful even through the persecution that not might come, not could come, but as the Bible says, 
will absolutely come. And it's, it's important that we understand where we stand in our faith. Are we with Christ even through the difficulties, even through the challenges? Or are we going to let those persecutions discourage us and even potentially move us, shift us, or draw us away from the faith? Uh, we're going to jump into the book of Acts because it's very encouraging to see how amazingly this church just explodes, uh, not just in numbers, but uh, of course the, the faith is spreading rapidly like fire in the early church age here, especially from the days of Pentecost onward. So I'm in Acts chapter 2 verse 41, we get a glimpse of of just how powerful the movement of God was in this early church. Acts 2, and I'm going to read verse 41. It says, Then those who gladly received His word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Mm. Praise God. <laughs> That's amazing. And, and, uh, and this continues on. Next chapter, Acts chapter 4, verse 4, and we're going to read verse 31. Notice what it says. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And when they had prayed, the place where, uh, where they were assembled together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So they're on fire. They're experiencing Christ. They understand who He is and they understand the, the wonderful life-changing uh, aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You could see the church is exploding here. Acts chapter 5, next chapter. Acts chapter 5, verse 42. It says, And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And so the church is growing. The gospel is moving. People are being changed. Their lives being transformed by the gospel of Jesus. And of course, by the time you get to Acts chapter 7, we're not going to read anything from there. Uh, but Acts chapter 7, we see that Stephen is in the, in the street preaching. He's reminding the leaders of Israel. He's eventually taken before the Sanhedrin and he's reminding them of what they've done and how they rejected the Messiah and how their time of probation is coming to a close. And what do they do? Instead of receiving the message, instead of receiving the gospel, they plug their ears, they take him outside the city, they stone him. And we know there that it says that they laid their coats, those who stoned him, at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, notice when we get to Acts chapter 8, what is happening here, because now Saul has been drafted, I guess you could say, to go wreak havoc. And I'm using the Bible's words here, havoc on these believers. And notice the response of the believers. That's the whole point of this lesson. Many people would run and, and go hide. And similar to what the disciples did when, uh, when Jesus was crucified, they all ran and hid because they were for fear of the Jews finding them and doing the same to them. They hid. But now this, this Pentecostal uh, movement, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit has, has now revived or awakened a spirit within them that they're not fearful of what's going to happen happen to them. They are, they are locked in on Christ. And so notice, we're going to start in verse 3 here, Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. It says, as Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, notice here, notice the response. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Notice they didn't scatter and go hide. They went and continued to preach the word. And then, and of course, the results of this, uh, verse 8, it says, and there was great joy in the city. So what was the response? response of Saul's persecution. Well, they might have scattered, but they continue to preach the word. And again, amid all of this persecution, you see the faith of these people because they're joyful to continue to be able to preach the word. Now, Saul would have a very similar uh, uh, situation happen to him because he's eventually going to be converted in the next chapter, chapter 9. On his way to Damascus, he's blinded and he realizes who his Lord really is. And uh, of course, call, Paul is called, now Saul becomes Paul, and he's called to now take this gospel, the gospel that he once was persecuting and the people of the gospel that he was once persecuting. Now he's become one of them and he is commissioned to go take this gospel to all of those people in Jerusalem who will believe and even the Gentiles. And Paul gives us his story over his life, all that he went through. And let me tell you something, this brother who once persecuted, he tells the story of how he also, amid all of this persecution, kept the faith. You get a glimpse of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verses 22 to 28. I'm going to begin reading partway, just a few words into verse 23 of 2 Corinthians 11. And Paul gives us a list here. I mean, this list is just amazing about the persecutions he went through. And many of us read this, this, this and think, man, if I went through that, how would I respond? Notice the faith of Paul. He says, in labors, 
more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. That was five times, five different occasions he received that. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. At night and a day, I've been, I've been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils of among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And notice it says here, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily is through all of this, what comes to my mind? What is on my mind? The fear of what's going to happen next, the fear of all that's happening that has happened to me and what might happen to me after this. He says, what comes to me, what comes upon me daily? He says, my deep concern for all the churches. His heart was that of the heart of Jesus through all of the persecution. I want to have that the, the heart of, of, of a soul. I want to have the heart, of course, of Jesus. Jesus was persecuted more than anyone. And through it all, he stayed true to his father. The question is, can we remain true to our savior through and amid persecutions that we might endure? I want that, but if not faith. I've done messages on this in the past, Bible studies on this. When you read in Daniel chapter 3, these three young men who are facing their lives being threatened, of course, not only threatened, but they are literally thrown into a fiery furnace. Uh, but before this, again, in the threatening of their lives, being burned up in a hot fiery furnace, that of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. What do they say? Uh, let's go to there, Daniel chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 16. And, and of course, our, our key words in verse 18 there. But Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 and onward. Uh, of course, it gives their Babylonian names here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king after he had threatened them uh, to, to give in and to bow to the, to the graven image, to this idol that he had erected. And it says here, it says, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. And I love these next three words, but... If not, I love that faith. That's the faith I want. Lord, I know you're able to save me. I know you're able to bring me through whatever. I know you're able to keep this trial from me and this hardship from me and this difficulty and, and that situation. I know you're able to keep us from all of that. But Lord, but if not, even if you don't, I love this. It says, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. In other words, we will remain true to our God, whether he delivers us or he does not. I love, I love that. That's the faith I want. And we have to be reminded that we have promises that our sufferings and our persecutions that, again, not that we might, not that we could endure. We will endure. That's a promise. You will suffer persecution for Christ's namesake. We have promises from God's word that this is not in vain. In fact, it says in James chapter one, verses two to four, that my brethren count it all joy mm -hmm. when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces, what is it? Patience. My goodness, I need patience. We all need patience. It says, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect to complete, lacking nothing. Now tied to that Romans chapter five, verses three and four. I love this as well. And Paul writes, someone who went through persecution, he knows a little bit about this. He says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character hope. We should count it all joy. We should find it an honor, as Peter would write, to be able to suffer as Christ suffered. Of course, in our humanity and in our carnality and in that sinful nature that we often fight, we don't want those persecutions. We don't want to have to go through them. We don't want to have to experience them. But the question is, can you, amid those persecutions, as the title says, still remain faithful to God as Paul did, as Stephen did, as the disciples did, as Jesus did to his father. I want to pray, Lord, help my unbelief. Give me the strength. Give me the heart of Jesus. Let me have the faith of Jesus Christ that I may stand confident and persevere to the end. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. It was encouraging. <laughs> Well, my name is John Dinsey. We're now on Wednesday's portion of the lesson, and the title is Caring for the Community. 
And I'm reading from the lesson. And uh, the early Christian church grew not only because its members preached the gospel, but because they lived the gospel. Believers modeled the ministry of Christ who went about all Galilee, teaching in this, their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases among the people. You cannot go wrong when you do as Jesus did. Praise the Lord. So we see that the early disciples modeled what Jesus did. And, you know, we, we used to have a sign. I don't know why it was taken off. They remodeled things. But there was a sign in the lobby that said, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is a very <laughs> powerful message when you think about it. Because really, by the way you live, by the way you talk, by the way you walk even, you are preaching something. Right. May it be the gospel. And so I encourage you to take this into consideration. And, you know, uh, Jesus said something to his disciples. I'm going to look it up here in John chapter 13 and verse 34. I know, this, I know that uh, the following lesson, the following day is going to talk about John 13, 35. So I, I won't go there for you. <laughs> John 13, 34, uh, Jesus says to his disciples, notice this, beautiful. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And this was one of the things that took place among the disciples. They love one another. And it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 44, now all who believed were together and had all things in common, verse 45, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Now, I want to stop right there for now because uh, you, uh, sometimes when you read this, some people carry away the message. They just say, well, they sold everything they had. They sold their houses and their possessions and they took the money and they started distributing among each other. No, all things were held in common. If there was a need, uh, they would let the need be known. And somebody says, well, I have some land. I'll sell that and let's meet that need. It wasn't that everybody sold everything at the same time. It was as the need arose. Otherwise, everybody would be homeless. Mm -hmm. Everybody would be uh, out in the streets. And so as the need arose is when these things were sold. So verse uh, 45, 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with Coming from Uzbekistan. Who knows where Uzbekistan is? I can't even pronounce the name. Uzbekistan is. Russia side, right? <laughs> right. So we have here Daniel Patterson is going to read a story for us. Okay? And then we'll continue on our discord. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Today's mission story is, take, is called One Broken String. Arthur got baptized in Usp... In Arthur got baptized in, in Uzbekistan when he was five but he didn't know anything about God. No one spoke to him about God or took him back to church after his baptism. Even though he never thought about God, he began wearing a cross-shaped earring when he was 14. He thought it looked cool. Then Arthur told his mother that he wanted to learn to play the guitar. Mother took him straight to a music store. Arthur's life was aimless, and she thought that a guitar might give him some purpose. Arthur picked out a brown electric guitar. At home, he found guitar lessons on YouTube and started trying to play. It wasn't easy. Pressing down on the strings hurt his fingers. But after a few days, the, the pain began to subside. 
His music, however, didn't sound anything like that of the YouTube teacher. <clears throat> Two weeks after buying the guitar, a string snapped. Arthur didn't know how to change the string, so he looked for help online. He found a phone number of someone named Artyom who offered guitar lessons. He called. I need to change a string, he said. Can you help? Artyom gave Arthur his home address. The address sounded familiar. Arthur wondered where he had heard it. Then he remembered. His mother used to work with a man named Pasha at that address. The two had built furniture together. Pasha had died. Are you by any chance Pasha's son? Arthur asked. Yes, I am, Artyom said. The next day, Artyom replaced the guitar string. Afterward, he asked Arthur if he knew how to play. Arthur tried to show what he had learned on YouTube, but Artyom stopped him. Stop, stop, he said. You're playing the chords backward. Suddenly, Arthur understood why his music didn't sound at all like that of the teacher on YouTube. He hadn't been playing correctly. Artyom invited Arthur to guitar lessons. At the first lesson, Arthur, Artyom commented on the cross-shaped earring in Arthur's ear. Are you a Christian, he asked. Arthur said he wasn't a Christian. At the second lesson, Artyom suggested meeting the next time in a room at the local Seventh-day Adventist church. The church was close to Arthur's home, and he agreed. As Arthur learned to play the guitar, he began to spend time with Artyom outside of lessons. He learned that Artyom was a global mission pioneer, a missionary who shares the gospel with people in his own culture. He accepted invitations to go hiking with Artyom and other Adventists in the mountains. When the hikers sat down to rest, Arthur enjoyed listening to them sing songs. Artyom played along on the guitar. That summer, Arthur went to an Adventist youth retreat in another city. He was caught off guard when a retreat speaker asked the attendees to split into pairs to pray. I, I am an atheist, he told the first person who offered to pray with him. The person went away. Arthur also told the next person who came over that he didn't believe in God. Moreover, he, he added, I've never prayed before. This person didn't go away. We can fix that, he said. He taught Arthur to pray. That night, Arthur thought for a long time about what had taken place. On Sabbath, he was amazed to see a young man get baptized at the retreat. I was baptized when I was five, he said. Why do Adventists baptize adults? He learned that Adventists understand the Bible to teach that people should be old enough to understand the Bible and the commitment that they are making to God before being baptized. The next Sabbath, Arthur went to the Adventist church near his home to worship for the first time. In the afternoon, he joined church members in handing out school supplies to needy children. He felt a new joy fill his heart, and he thought, what is the point of living if I don't help others? It was a turning point in his life. He no longer wanted to live an aimless existence. He resolved to help others and to know God. Eight months have passed since Arthur attended, started attending church regularly. He has been studying the Bible and he wants to give his heart to Jesus in baptism.
He is glad that his guitar string broke. I believe in God because of a broken guitar string, he said. Part, part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open the first day's se seven-day Adventist elementary school in, in, U in Uzbekistan. Amen. And I don't, don't know about you, but I heard several different ways in which we can reach people through this story. And one of them is because one of them is because through music, right? We can meet, reach others through music. Now I want to welcome everyone who is at church now. Happy Sabbath. And those who are online, we welcome you. Right? And today's topic was denial of self. Right? We're talking about ways where we should or things that we should do in denying self in order to worship God. And put him first every time. Now I'm going to continue and finish up for personal ministries. Now to all comes the temptation to gratify selfish, extravagant desires. But let us remember that the Lord of life and glory came to this world to teach you money to the lesson of self-denial. Right? Not only is Christ our Lord, our Master, our teacher, and our rabbi, but he also is our example. All that he calls us to do, he experienced equally. In Luke 22, in the Garden of Gethsemane, on the night before his crucifixion, he had one of the most difficult conversations ever recorded. In verse 42, Jesus prays, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Luke, who was a doctor, is the only gospel writer who recalls that Jesus shed blood with his sweat glands. Under extreme moments of stress, the blood vessels near the temples and forehead break and mix with the sweat, giving the appearance of sweating blood. What was the source of this pressure and strain? What caused this level of pressure? Matthew's rendition of, rendition of the story in, 26, in 20, Matthew 26, 39 to 42, depicts something that sheds light on these questions. Christ prayed for the cup to pass from him, meaning the cause of death to be averted. It wasn't only the physical death, but the separation from the presence of the Father that he desired to avoid. This desire was so passionate that he asked again in verse 42, O oh my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink, your will be done. Though he had a literal choice of whether he would die or not, there was also the underlying issue of whether he was going to deny self or not. After the first and second time, Christ utters, not as I will, but as you will, and your will be done, respectively. He completely denies self and gives God his knowing, being, and having. He entrusts the future to God. Being unwilling to separate from the Father was not a bad thing. If anything, that is the one thing we all should desire. But here Christ was not battling what was moral or not. He was not choosing between good and evil. Here Christ was struggling with whether to follow, us, follow his desires or the desire of his heavenly father. The temptation was to use his divinity in a way that could indulge a selfish desire.
in order to become acquainted with the disappointments and trials and griefs that came to human beings, Christ reached the lowest depths of woe and humili humiliation. He has traveled the path that he asked his followers to travel. He says to them, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. But professing Christians are not always willing to practice the self-denial that Savior calls for. They are not willing to bind about their wishes and desires in order that they may have more to give to the Lord. One says, my family are expensive in their taste and it costs much to keep them. This shows that he and they, and they need to learn the lessons of economy taught by the life of Christ. This little session, right. So, that, this part of it says, The majesty of heaven, the king of glory, left his riches, his splendors, honor, and glory, in order to save sinful man, condescended to a life of humility, poverty, and shame. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despite the shame. Oh, why are we so sensitive to trial and reproach, to shame and suffering, when our Lord has given us such an example? Now this is the end of Sabbath school. We are now for the person, for personal ministry. We'll come and continue. Do have yourself a wonderful and blessed Sabbath. Stand, let us sing, sing the personal ministry song. Brother, we should help us out with it now. All right, he's seeking the loss. Seeking the loss. Just the first stanza and the chorus. Seeking the loss, yes, kindly entreating. Wanders us on the mountain astray. Come unto me, his message repeating. Words of the master speaking today. Going afar, afar upon the mountain. again into the fall the fall of my redeemer Jesus the Lamb Jesus the Lamb the, the Lamb for sinners alright let us pray Father in heaven and our great God I want to give you thanks Lord and praise for the opportunity you have given us as your children to be co laborers with you. We pray, Holy God, that you'll cleanse each and every soul here this morning. Lord, I pray that you'll release us from any and every all that the enemy may have upon these your people. I pray this morning that you'll pour your blood upon each and every one of us, Lord, and let every spirit of demons and devil leave from our, out and among us, and that you will fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Lord, as we are, you know, in uh, evangelistic mode, Lord, during the cell site, I pray, Holy God, that your spirit will be poured out in this cell site, poured upon each and every member, help us to do our part and to invite others to come and to taste and see that the Lord is good. For Jesus' sake, amen.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. No, man. Happy Sabbath, everyone. And how are we feeling? We're feeling what? We're feeling blessed. No, I am here to do a promotion. No, the promotion that I'm here to do is that on April 20th, which is next week, Sabbath, the men's ministry department will be embarking on a week of revival. When do we start? I don't like how the church is not sure. When do we start? That's right. Next week, Sabbath. That's April 20th. Now, I, I want you to follow me very closely. Now, on next week, Sabbath, the 20, which is April 20th, we are going to be starting at 9.15. Right? And, that, and this is our week of revival. And the speaker is Elder Denzel Cunningham. Then we're going from Sunday night to Thursday night, right? And we are starting at 7.15 p.m. nightly. That's our week of revival with Elder Denzel Cunningham. Then, uh, you know, we could have just decided that we are going to rest on Friday night. But we decided we decide that on Friday night, we're going to do something special. So on Friday night, which is the 26th of April, we are going to be having a praise and worship Vesper. And uh, our guest speaker for that night is Pastor Ranjo Brown, also known as the singing pastor. So you know that Friday night is a night you can't, you can't miss Sabbath uh, to Thursday neither, you know, but Friday night is a night that you cannot miss. And let me tell you, you see, Friday night, we only have Pastor Brown's photo on the flyer. We have a special guest joining us on that Friday night as well. But I won't be spilling the beans. I won't be spilling any secrets. In order for you to know, you have to do what? Come Friday night. Then, on, then after the Friday night, we go to the 27th. Right? And on the 27th, that is going to be our men's day. Right? And uh, our special guest speaker is Pastor Michael Lewis. And uh, once again, we only have Pastor Lewis' picture on the flyer. You see, come Bible class, come AY, you don't want to miss the 27. We have special guests coming in to ensure that the 27 is a day that you will never forget. And in the midst of all of this, our theme is men of God, anointed and appointed. I want the church to say that with me. So let's go after two. What's the theme? After two, one, two. Hold on, let me just check the time. It's 10.55 a.m. And I don't like how that sound. I believe we can do better as Olympians. So let's go again with the theme. After two, one, two. Listen. Bridging, when we're saying the theme, we're supposed to say, gentlemen, when, even if the females don't want to say it, gentlemen, when we're saying the theme, we're supposed to say it with our chest high. So we're supposed to say, listen, the theme is 
men of God anointed and appointed. Now, last, the last thing under our men's deal with them. Come next week, Sabbath, and we will worship together. Now, lastly, I would like to promote our cell meetings. So let me see the hands of all those who have been supporting our cell meetings. No, no, no. Virgin, I want you to understand that our cell meetings are not just for pretty names. You see, the cell meetings are for us to meet individuals where they are. And that is within uh, their homes, within the communities that they live in. So I'm going to be asking that members, you come out, that you invite a friend to come at these cell meetings. And as you can see on the flyer, we have different zones. We have three zones, zone A, zone B, and zone C. So zone A meets in the Bay Farm Villa area, and the classes are temperance, love, and joy. So if you are a part of these classes, then you meet uh, in the Bay Farm Villa area. Zone B, this is Ella Gill McDonald class. You meet, in, you meet at 11 U, that's 23 11 U. And also you meet at 13 Lotan Avenue. And the classes are meekness, peace, and faith. For zone C, and the leader for this zone is Ella Olivier Phillips. You meet at 20 Pononcia Avenue, and the classes are gentleness and goodness. Virgin, the flyer will be posted again in the WhatsApp group. We're going to ask that you pray for the program, you support the program, and you invite out um, those who are in the community as we go through the lessons each night on a Sunday night. Happy Sabbath, church. Well, guess what? Um... Brother Francis, stop eat meat. Brother Francis, don't read the rice and all those stuff. We're going the healthy way now. All right, so come this, the 20th of this month. Guess what, Regin? We're going to have a herbalist doctor coming at our church. To help us to cut off meat and all those stuff that we are eating is, that is not good for our body. Because, Virgin, from a stop eat meat, my body feel different. My body feel more energized. Virgin, I can tell you, many of you guys need to, to try it. But come this, the 20th of this month, just come out to hear what the doctor has to say. And... In AY time. So, you can't afford to miss it. Invite somebody to come, Bridget. Because we need to get more healthier. And we, we, we must. Because we want to live longer. So, Bridget, just invite a friend to come out the 20th in the evening at AY to hear about our healthy lifestyle of eating. Men's choir, please meet outside. Thank you. Those who have asked to lead out, please meet in the vestry, in the mini vestry. And I'm going to ask some sweet singers in Zion to come. 
and to sing a few songs at this time. Happy Sabbath, church. At this time, I invite you all to take your hymnals in hand and turn to hymn number 340. How cheering is the Christian's hope? 440, sorry. <laughs> How cheering is the Christian's hope? While toiling here below, it boils us up, it boils us up while passing through this wilderness of woe. It boils us up while passing through this wilderness of woes. It points us to a land of rest Where saints with Christ will reign Where we shall meet, where we shall meet The loved of earth and never part of, never part again we shall meet the love of earth and never part again. Fly lingering more, men's fly, oh fly, oh Savior, quickly come. We long to see. We long to see thee as thou art and reach that blissful shore. We long to see thee as thou art and reach that blissful home. Hymn number 212, it must be the breaking of the day. Tis almost time for the Lord to come, I hear the people say. The stars of heaven are growing dim. It must be the breaking of the day. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. The night is almost gone. The day is coming on. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. The signs foretold in the sun and moon, in earth and sea and sky. Aloud proclaim to all mankind the coming of the master joy at night. Oh, it must be the breaking of the 
Happy Sabbath, everyone. I do hope that you are having a wonderful Sabbath thus far. Please listen to the announcements for Sabbath, April 13, 2024. Our worship continues with our Bible class this afternoon at 3.30. AY will follow at 4.30. And Vesper will close the day's worship. Our cell meeting continues this and every Sunday evening beginning at 7.15. Also, our regular Wednesday evening prayer, praise, and testimony service begins at 7.30 each Wednesday evening. The deacon and deaconesses department will be hosting a corporate prayer and fasting tomorrow at Hope Gardens beginning at 7 a.m. The entire church is invited to be a part of this fasting and the prayer. The children's choir practice this and every Sabbath afternoon for the month of April, they are preparing for chil children's child's month and, you know, children's day in May and all of that. Children and adolescent team luncheon meeting April 20, 20th at 2024 at 3 p.m. In the EJC boardroom, the luncheon begins at 1, or 1 p.m. and will end at 3 p.m. Please make the sacrifice to attend. And this luncheon is for those, the officers of the department. Men's choir practice this evening after Vespers. Potluck will be on the 4th of May, the first Sabbath in May, the church potluck. Keep that in mind. Each adult is being asked to adopt a child each Sabbath to maintain reverence and order in the sanctuary. Each adult is being asked to adopt a child each Sabbath to maintain reverence and order in the sanctuary. You realize that I repeated that for emphasis? Please support the children's department. Please pray for Sister Sylvia Roberts, Robertson Winter, who is, still, who is not well. Please pray for her. See that she's not here today. Continue to pray for Sister Robertson Winter. Robertson Winter. Please pray for Sister Carmen Radcliffe's niece, who did a major surgery, major operation. She's out of the, um, the, um, the surgery, was successful. However, she's not out of danger. So please continue to pray for the niece of Sister Carmen Radcliffe. Please pray for Sister Monica and her family. She's asking the church to remember her in our prayers. And remember to pray for all the individuals who have been um, on the prayer list. Continue to pray for them as they need our prayers. And prayer changes things. Amen, church? Amen. Prayer changes things. Okay, this is our wonderful note. Sister Nadine Lawrence is celebrating 32 years in the nursing fraternity. Today, April the 13th, that's a, that's a milestone. And we see COVID went by and many nurses died, right? But God protected her through all of this. And uh, we are celebrating with you, Sister Lawrence. And we pray that God will continue to bless you as you continue to serve in the capacity that he has placed you on this earth to serve. And from the women's ministry department, you have always been a tower of support to us. You're a silent member, but we, 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 we give you the support and thank you for all that you have done towards our department. 
All right, the funeral service for the father of uh, Elder Olivine Phillips will be on Sunday, April the 21st in St. Elizabeth at 2 p.m. For further details, please see Elder Gail McDonald Ellis this evening after Vespers. And happy belated birthday greetings going out to the following individuals. Ella Olivier Phillips, who celebrated her birthday yesterday, April 12th. Greetings are coming from Sister Beverly Cole, Ella Gail, McDonald Ellis, and the rest of the church family. We hope you had a wonderful day in the Lord. Okay, belated birthday greetings also going out to Benjamin Allen, who celebrated his birthday on this. It's tomorrow, so I get wrong information. I got wrong information. So tomorrow you'll be celebrating. So it, it, we are preempting. Where is Benjamin? He's here. Hi, Benji. Okay, so tomorrow will be Benjamin's birthday, and the greetings are coming from Auntie Diane. I don't know why her name is first on the list. Our mother, his mother and father, Sister Rose Jackson, Mama Jackson, and Sister Bev, and the rest of the church family will wa want to wish that Benjamin has a wonderful day tomorrow, celebrating life. Okay? And any other persons who are celebrating birthday today, please stand with the rest of the celebrant as we um celebrate with you your belated and upcoming any other person celebrating birthday our celebrated birthday this week okay sister sister olivine first elder please come down we want to sing for you brother sims um oh yeah we were mention last week i still knew that and happy belated birthday to brother sims who celebrated his birthday on the, on the 8th of April, right? All right, let us go now. Two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear celebrant. Happy birthday to you. Hip, hip. Lord bless. May the good Lord bless you. May the good Lord bless you. Happy birthday to you. And so we do hope that you continue to give the Lord the years that he will give to you. Our thought for today is 1 John 4, verse 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Okay? Sunset this evening at 6.23, and next Sabbath evening at 6.24. Do have a spirit-filled Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everybody. It is good to be in God's house. One more Sabbath. What do you say? It is good to see all of you. We, I can't believe I see somebody sleeping already, you know. Touch the person next to you and say, rise and shine. For your light has come. This is the day. That the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. And be glad in it. Amen. Yes. So, 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 so it's not the preacher that puts some of us to sleep. Some of us come with our sleep from our home. To the house of the Lord. <laughs> I, I, I trust that even if we are weary. Because I know sometimes we really had a rough week. And uh, you know sometimes the sleep gets the better of us. But I trust today we will not. 
miss any of the blessing that the Lord has in store for us. You are looking so good from no here to dark here to gray here. God is good from straight nose to broad, nose to lean nose. Oh my, you are looking good. And from long here to short here to wig, you are looking good just the same. I am glad to welcome you and I'm glad that I'm greeting you in no other place but in the house of the Lord. I want to extend my, my joy for those who are celebrating birthdays. And I'm most glad that they are born again, born in the kingdom of God. And I pray they will press on to receive that special reward. And then I want to commend all those, all the, this cell group initiative from all different corners in this community. The Advent trumpet is being blown. Amen. In different areas as you move around. It's good to see the brethren assembled in small groups and the echo of that special message is going out. He that hath and hear, let him hear. I trust that we will participate, brethren. And not only, as the lesson tells us, like the, the early saints, not only be those who preach, but live the word by God's grace. I trust today that we will all be richly blessed. I want to welcome, along with the rest of us, my friends who have dropped in from St. Thomas, coming to Olympic Way for the first time. The, the husband and wife, uh, their name is Bedward, right? You know there was a song about Bedward, right? Okay. But uh, these, 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 <laughs> they said, I don't know if they're related to him. But, but, but they are my good friends, and I trust today as they share in our worship, they will be blessed by the Olympic Way experience at the feet of Jesus. I trust today, brethren, God will bless us. Let's remember the different initiatives that are coming up, and I want to encourage the men. Men are a scarce commodity in universities. In fact, in, in many places of excellence and eloquence, men are short. And men are short in the church as well. I want to encourage those who are here. There's an initiative that is coming up for all of us as men. Let us put it on our schedule and plan to be there so we can be nurtured. And wives, sometimes we understand how things have to go. You have to tell your husband what to do. You have to direct him in the way he ought to go sometimes. Am I not talking the truth here? Oh, I don't hear the wife saying anything. They're very quiet. All right. Don't, don't let us know that is you rule him. All right. Keep it, keep it, keep it, keep it quiet there. But sometimes you have to tell your husband, like, look here. I want you to be a better man or I want you to keep on the path you are on. So guess what? Make your appointment to be at that program, right? So I'm encouraging all of us to be there and also... Invite some of our family members and friends for all these things that are equipping us to be better people for time, better individuals for eternity. May God bless us today as we hear his word and as we sing and as we experience his presence through prayer. God bless you. Stand for call to worship. For our 
our call to worship, we will turn to the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 34 to 39. And I read in your hearing, Romans chapter 8, verses 34 to 39. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, he is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation our distress, our persecution, our famine, our nakedness, our peril, our sword, as it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loveth us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angel, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church is now called to worship. Shall we pray? Holy Father, great God, we shout in heaven. Lord, we just want to thank you for your love and your mercy towards us. We thank you for being here with us today. May your Holy Spirit's presence tabernacle with us. May we, may we receive the blessing we stand in need of, we pray. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we beg with thanksgiving. Amen. Be seated, please. Happy Sabbath, church. Okay, God is good. Would the congregation please stand? Would everyone please stand? And I want you to do something for me. Take a look at each other. Look how beautiful you are. Look around, look at each other, look how beautiful you are. Now, I would like all the members of the Olympic Way Seven Day Adventists to be seated. All members, please be seated. Wonderful. We have some visiting friends, man. We see, see some little visiting friends among us. We have some little visiting friends. Could my little visiting friends please stand? If you are not a member of the Olympic Way Seventh-day Adventist Church, please stand. Look at our beautiful flowers. No, I would like everyone to turn around and look at our beautiful guests who are among us in our midst today. The privilege is mine to welcome you all to church today. And I pray that the blessing that we all come seeking, we shall see, we shall receive. And now we have Sister Barnes among us. That's her, look how beautiful Sister Barnes, Marcia Barnes is, smiling so beautiful in her radiant color. God is good. And I also know that we have some visiting friends online as well. Welcome, Christ welcomes you. We're going to do a little activity and I want everyone to stand. This is our welcome song, and I would like everyone to greet each other with love, smiling faces. 
and feel welcome. Our welcome song, we all know this welcome song. I'm rich, I'm free. We're going to tell the world that we are happy because we have who in our hearts? We have who in our hearts? So can the congregation please stand and sing along because God has been great to us and we are going to worship him. After two, one, two. I'm rich, I'm free. I want to tell the world that I'm happy. I've got Jesus right here, right here in my heart. I'm alive and living all because I'm forgiven. I've got Jesus right here right here in my heart i love the thrill that i feel when we get together with god's wonderful people i love the thrill that i feel when i get together with god's wonderful people it's so nice to see those happy faces Praising God in heavenly places, that's the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's, God's, God's wonderful people. Our opening hymn will be Hymn 213. Hymn 213. Shall we all stand? Lift up the trumpet and low let it ring, because Jesus is coming again. We go together after two, one, two. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring, Jesus is coming again. Cheer up in pilgrims with joy full and sing. Jesus is coming again, coming again, he's coming again, Jesus is coming again. Echoing hilltops, proclaim it he plays, Jesus is coming again, coming in glory. Jesus is coming again, coming again, he's coming again, Jesus is coming again. Heavens of earth tell the vast wondrous throng, Jesus is coming again, tempest and whirlwind. Jesus is coming again, coming again, it's coming again, Jesus is coming again. Nations are angry, by this we do know, Jesus is coming again. Knowledge increases, men run to and fro. Jesus is coming again, coming again, he's coming again. Jesus is coming again. Amen. 
please remain standing. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. Our scripture reading is taken from St. John 14, verse 1 to 3. If you found it, please say amen. <laughs> Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, where ye may be also. This is a portion of God's holy word. Amen. Now, dear Lord, as we pray, take our hearts and minds far away from the press of the world. As we come before you, Jesus, Lord, I pray that you will take full control today, mighty God. Lord, I place your people today in the congregation in your almighty God. Lord, remember our pastor, O oh God, Terrell, O oh I put Pastor Terrell in the Almighty God, Lord, the elders, oh God, the deaconess and deacon, mighty God, I put every member in the hand this morning, mighty God, in the hand. Lord Jesus, I pray that you will visit each and every us. Remember the sick among us, oh my God. Mighty God, Lord Jesus, remember the speak, oh God, today, Lord Jesus, as you come, mighty God, Lord Jesus, let's still be slain, oh God, and that you will be in our mighty God. Lord Jesus, I pray, mighty God. That we will take full control one more time again, Lord. And we tell a thanks in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Music play, plays an important role in our worship. And at this time, we'll, uh, we'll have to sing for us Sister Diane Lichmore Clark. Let our minds be here and not far away. So even if you don't hear the person's voice, you must be worshiping. So get yourself in tuned. This morning, we know that we serve a risen Savior. And the reason why we're here, it's because of him. God sent his son Jesus to die for us. And that's the story we want to hear. The song says, I'm tired of hollowed sounding words because sometimes we hear so many different things. 
persons coming to us with so many news. That's not what we really want to hear. Let us focus on Jesus because he died for all of us. And he's a reason for our praise. I'm tired of hollowed sounding words. I'm tired of empty promise. Could someone sing a simple song of Jesus' love? Tell me, tell me the story of Jesus. about his love tell me the old old story it will be my theme in glory tell me the story of Jesus tell me the old old story it will be my theme in glory tell me once again about his love like eagle wings he lift us up above the world around us like cool refreshing summer rain he It's now time for the offertory. Ellen G. White says, those who think that they can be good Christians and close their ears and hearts to the cause of God for their liberalities are in a fearful deception. Brethren, it is now time for us to give back unto the Lord. And the deacons will now stand in their places. I'm just asking them to come stand, come forward, and the congregation also to stand as we pray for the days. Deacon and deaconesses, I'm sorry, um, for the, <laughs> the days of it. Let us pray. Father in heaven and our God, as you have given us strength, Lord, the life in our body, Lord, belongs to you. Lord, if you remove that life this morning, Lord, Madden, our some Isaacs, Lord, will have to come for our corpse. 
And Lord, today we are grateful to you for life. And Lord, all the other blessings that you have bestowed upon us. And as you wait upon us this morning, Lord, for tithing and offering, I pray, God, that you'll touch our hearts and help us, Lord, to give to the cause of God. And we don't, you don't want us to give grudgingly, Lord, but, Lord, that we'll give with a heart of sincerity, that we'll be blessed for Christ's sake. Amen. Have us be seated, please. All right. Those who think that they can be good Christians and close their ears and hearts to the call of God for their liberalities are in a fearful deception. There are those who abound in professions of great love for the truth. And so far as words are concerned, have an interest to see the truth advance, but who do nothing for its advancement. Brethren, if we are in need of the truth to go out, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, if we have such an art, we should not be a bystander, but we should give to the cause of God for the furtherance of the gospel. It is as we give, that is how the gospel moves. Everything takes money. You know, to print a page, it's very costly. You know, and uh, electricity bills. Also, our pastors, our schools, and um, universities, brethren, we need to give to the cause of God. There are some countries who have the gospel has not yet reached, and the gospel have to go out in all countries before the coming of Christ. Brethren, if we want Christ to come, we need to do our part with our money. It said the faith of such is dead, not being made perfect by works. The Lord never made such a mistake as to convert a soul and leave it under the power of covetousness. Brethren, we can't outgive the Lord. Let us stand as we sing the thankful song. Sister Lynch, one. Amen. You may be seated. All right. It's now time for the feeding of the lamb. And we'll sing our regular song, Jesus Loves the Little Children, as Sister Diane Lichmore Clark comes again to feed them. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, whether they are black or white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Let us pray for all the children, all the children of the world. Whether they are black or white, all are precious in his sight. Let us pray for all the children of the world. All right, everybody, boys and girls, it is time for your story, so we're not going to be drinking right now, okay? Let's put it away.
Sit over there. All right, boys and girls, are you ready for your story? So you have to be looking at me now. You can't be looking at the person beside you. And you're not going to be correcting anyone beside you because I'm watching you myself. All right? Now today, boys and girls, we have a very special story for you. And the title of my story is God is always there. What's the title of the story? God is always there. Very good. You notice we say children because it's for you. God is always there. And I have a very special Bible verse that I want you to learn. Can we have that Bible verse up on the screen? It's Psalms 46 verse 1. If you can read, read with me. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Yes, boys and girls. And so, I want you to remember that, okay? And um, listen how I tell you, I'm watching you. If, you are, if there is anything in your mouth, take it out because we are in church. Mm-hmm. If you're chewing anything, food otherwise, take it out. Because it's your story. And we want you to understand this. That God is always near. A very present help. He's very present in trouble. And I have a sheet of paper here. I'm going to show you. So when I say, each time I say very present, I want you to say, what's this? Yes, when I have some boys and girls who can read. The bigger boys and girls, you will help the smaller ones, right? What is this? God is present. Very good. Let's practice. God is present. Right. He's always there. And so, have you ever felt alone before? Have you ever felt afraid? All right, I don't want you to answer yet. I will tell you when you're going to answer because I'm going to indicate to you or I'm going to tell you to raise your hand. Have you ever gone to school for the first time and you have no friend? Raise your hand. All right. Do you know that God is always there? He is always there. Have you ever had somebody who has died before? God is always present. He is always there. So boys and girls, it doesn't matter what problems you have at home, at school, even when you come to church, if you feel that you are new and you have no friend, remember, God is always present. He is always there. All right. Now let me tell you a story. It's a true story. It's a very true story. Do you have any brothers or sisters? All right. So last year, my little, my smallest brother died. And I was very, very sad. I was very sad, you know. Some of the times when I go home, my sister was there. My next brother was there. Uncle Roy was there. My aunties were always calling me. But I felt alone and very sad. So you know what I did, boys and girls, some of the times? I would go by myself or if I'm in my bed, I would just cry, cry, cry. You know, sometimes nobody saw when I was crying. And I was sad. But God is always present. He is? Always He's always there. And he reminded me that it doesn't matter what is happening. He is never going to leave us or forsake us. Right? 
when you go to school and if sometimes you find yourself you don't understand the work that teacher gives to you always remember God is present he is he is always there and so boys and girls you are children of God you are a child say touch yourself and say I am a child of God I am a child of God and I want this side over here to do it for me put your hands and touch yourselves ready say I am a child of God very good and because you're a child of God and because Jesus loves you that song says Jesus love me this I know he said he will never leave you so no what whatever you are going through whatever the problem whatever situation it may be bigger than you God is always there so now I want you to stand all the boys and girls stand and we are going to pray stand and I want you to repeat after me everybody all right, it's not time for the prayers yet, but I want you to repeat after me. And when we are praying, boys and girls, close your eyes so you're not distracted. And we're going to say, thank you, Father, for your love. I know you love me because in the Bible, it tells me you are always present. You are always there. In times of trouble. And so, Lord, we thank you for all you have done and what you are about to do. Thank you for your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, boys and girls, you may go back to your seats quietly. You're walking in the sanctuary. Let's walk back to your seats. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Whether they are black or white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. At this time, we are going to be singing hymn 505. I need the prayers of those I love. Let us all stand. And can we have that song on the screen, please? Hymn 505. Everybody everywhere, once you are able to stand, please stand. So at this time, we are going to be praying for the families beginning I, J, K, L. I, J, K, L. Surnames beginning with I, J, K, L. I need the pearls of those I love while traveling down life's rugged way that I may true and faithful be and live for Jesus every day. I want my friends to pray for me to bear my tempted soul above and intercede with God for me. I need the prayers of those I love. Father, I stretch my hands to thee nor the help I know. If thou would withhold thine hand from me, Lord, where would I go? This morning, God, your children have come into your courts one more time to magnify and to worship you. Mighty God, we come this morning because we are your subject, Lord, and we need to hear from you. 
Father God, the task has been given to me to pray, to intercede for those that have names beginning with I, J, K, and L. Mighty God, you know that there is nothing good in any of us. But because we have accepted your righteousness, Lord, we can come boldly to the throne of grace where we will find pardon and forgiveness of our sin. Forgive us, Lord. Empty us of everything that is unlike thee. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness and make us be able to stand before you. Mighty God, as your children come to the altar this morning, mighty God, you know the homes from which they have come. You know the situation which they are aligned to. Mighty God, you know the ins and outs in their lives. Mighty God, those who are suffering mental um, health problems, I pray even now that you will touch them, Lord. Whatever they, if it is sick from the head to the toe, mighty God, we know that you are still the great physician. This morning, God, I pray that you will stretch forth your hands of mercy and you will touch each and every one that is in need of a touch from you so that you might grant healing because by your stripes, Lord, we are healed. Father God, some persons have financial problems. Mighty God, but you own the cattle upon a thousand hills. Mighty God, some Lord God have financial issues that they cannot even talk about. But mighty God, you know everything. And mighty God, you are in the business of canceling. You are in the business of canceling the bad debts. You are in the business of canceling everything, Lord, that will cause your children to suffer. Mighty God, this morning you have those, Lord, who are of strongholds over our lives. But, oh God, we know that you are the chain breaker. This morning, Lord, as we come before you, we ask, Lord, that you will deliver somebody. Mighty God, we pray that you will deliver each and every one of us, Lord, from the things, Lord God, that so easily beset us. Mighty God, I pray that you will be with those with surnames from I. So El, mighty God, I pray that you will go to their homes and Lord God, you will set up your camp there and you will cause their father their lives never to be the same again. We thank you, Lord, for them. We pray that you will put an edge around them as you put an edge around Job. And mighty God, you cause your lives to be prosperous. I pray, God, that you will touch every aspect of their lives. I pray, God, that everything that the enemy has set up, you will mash it down even now. Because, Lord, we are in a warfare and the enemy wants to destroy each and every one of us. So, Lord, if we think that there is not something going on by the devil in our lives, we need to think again. Because is aim is to destroy us but Lord God we are so grateful that we are under the banner of Prince Emmanuel we are under the banner of the, 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 the lion of the tribe of Judah who can break every chain so this morning in the name of Jesus we decree and declare over the lives of your children that they will be prosperous they will be healthy mighty God they will be well they will be fine in Jesus I decree over their lives that their marriage is well. Lord God, I decree over their lives that their finances are well. I, I decree over their lives that the enemy will have no stronghold in their homes, in their workplaces. I pray, God, that you will touch them right now and that everything that has been declared, oh God, it will come to pass in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I need the prayers of God. I want my friends to pray for me, to bear my tempted soul above, and intercede with God for me. I need the prayers of those I love. It gives me great pleasure this morning to introduce to us the person who will 
present God's word to God's people. This individual is an educator, yes, teacher by profession. She wears so many hats in her church. Sabbath school, personal ministries, treasurer, leader in training, part of um, leader in charge of health and personal ministry. Uh, and you know, when one person has so many responsibility, you know that this person must be capable enough. And this person must be someone who is connected to Christ. Because to lead these various departments or be a part of them, it's no easy task. Today, to present God's word to us is Sister Claudia Bedward. She's from the Woodford Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's in St. Thomas. And her husband is here to give her the support. She has two grown children. They have two grown children. Yes. And when I say grown, I mean grown because one is married. And so today she has come to share God's word. I ask that you pray her up that as she speak, she will speak the thus said the Lord. And we will indeed be closer drawn to Christ as we prepare for his second coming. However, before Sister Bedward present God's word, our men's chorale will bless our heart with a preparatory song. Gold to live in the 
In heaven, there is a mansion for the pure and the free. I have a feeling. Are you having that feeling at this moment, family? I have a feeling. It might as well be me. Oh, what a blessing. Surely, you have heard from the Lord in what? In music, in heaven. And the scripture reading said that what? He has gone to what? To prepare a place. And then the, the, the meditation said, I have a feeling it might have well be me. What? A mansion. He has gone to prepare. I'm just picking words because I don't know the song. But I have a feeling it might of well be me. Praise God. I just want to thank my sister. The first song, I don't know it again, but what I got from it is that we have so many empty promises at times, don't it? But the promise that Jesus gave to us, what? He will fulfill that promise. Thank you, my sister, for that song. It is a blessing. And the men's choral, it is a blessing. Praise God. And the children's story. What was on it? Always what? Oh, praise God. It's a blessing. God is always what? He's always there. I just want to say to you, my family, that I, I am honored to be here. It's not anything good that I have done. I'm just an empty vessel. I'm a nobody. Remember that our righteousness is like filthy rugs before God. Want to be used by him. So whatever I'm going to present here today, you heard it before, right? You heard it before. But guess what? God loves us so much that he continues to warn us. And so today, I'm so happy to be here. And the message come to us today from the word of God. And if I should entitle it, I would say the words that you are expecting me to say. I will come again. I will come again. And this is no empty promise. It is no empty promise. Family, we are living in the time where there are calamities by land and by sea. Massive floods, raging fires, unrelinquished droughts, landslide, cyclones, and storm hit across the world, killing and displacing tens of thousands of people. Are we there, family? Then, then last year, 
one of the most destructive events happens, right? Uh, an earthquake, 7.8 and 7.5, that struck Turco, Turkey near to Syria, Barda, on the 6th of February last year. You know how many people was affected? 14 million people were affected by one earthquake. How many died? How many do you think died? 50,783 persons died in Turkey. One earthquake. And um, in Syria, 8,476 died. Right here, right now, in this year, we are hearing of calamities in the U.S. March 26. What do we heard of? A bridge collapse, don't it? A ship it into what? Baltimore Bridge, and it collapses. We know that this collapse can bring a lot of stuff, spin off to the world, right? Because it will what? It will affect economic what? Economic? Right, and also it will affect supply chain, right? We can't get the goods and services that we need. These unsettled state of society, the alarms of wars, bold robberies, we are seeing that in Jamaica, don't it? Um, theft, murders are committed on every hand. Men possessed with demons taking the life of others. Those who hold their reins of government are not able, they are not able to solve this problem, right? They are not able to solve this problem, okay? Are they? They try to find solutions. We can look in our own country, don't it? And we see what is happening. They use the what? The state of emergency? Here, there, and everywhere. And uh, so they go into Montego Bay and use it there. The criminal run to where? To St. Elizabeth. If they go out there, they go into somewhere else. They don't have a solution to the problem. Let us pray. Father in heaven, it's me again, Lord. It's me again. I am unworthy. I am undone. I shouldn't even be standing before your people. But at this moment, mighty God, I'm asking for a fresh anointing. I'm asking you, Lord, that you will touch me. I'm asking, Lord, that these words that your people hear over and over again will go forth today like a two-edged sword cutting the hearts of your people so that we will be prepared to meet you when you return. This is my asking in Jesus' name. Amen. If we go to our scripture reading, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. He believed in God. Believe also in me. And we know that it's Jesus saying these words, right? In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Here is the promise now. It said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also, I see my little boys and girls. Let us imagine. Let us imagine for a moment. Imagine your favorite city or your favorite town or where you would like to be in this life. Imagine a city without potholes, without traffic, without pollution or crime or any kind. The Bible tells us of a city with streets paved with gold, and within its walls made of pure jasper. There won't be even one person coughing. The, the little things we're looking at, coughing, sneezing, or even coming down with a flu. Everyone will be perfect in health, and we'll enjoy each other company. Would you like to be in this city? Well, 
Not only can you visit this city, but you can live there. You can live there as far as our mind can imagine, family. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 said, But as it is written, eyes have not seen, nor hear, heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. This place that Jesus is preparing for us is beyond our wildest imagination. Why? Why? Because the Bible said, eyes have not seen, right? Neither your ears hear, right? You can only imagine, but it's beyond us. It's beyond our imagination. Whatever we can think, it is more beautiful. It is more exquisite. Give me some words to explain it. Amen. Praise God. We are nearing there. Do you believe it? We are nearing there. We are seeing our eyes are seeing what is happening. But Jesus foretold us. Jesus outlined it in Luke chapter 21 verse 25 to 27. Jesus said the signs that would help us identify our place in this earth's history and know when we are approaching the end. What a loving God we serve. Mm? We wouldn't even know that we are living in the end of time with all of these calamities and all of these stuff that is going on if we weren't told. But we were told. Jesus said there will be sign in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. And on the earth, this stress of nation with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart failing them for fear. Men's heart failing them for fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. Isn't men fearful? Haven't you heard about it? Haven't you heard about uh, 2030, what is coming in 2030? Haven't you heard about climate change? And if we continue this way, this world will be no more? Mm? Have you heard about it? Men, men's heart are failing them for fear. And Jesus continued to say, for the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Family, we feel, we see, we heard of all of these things. But let not what? Let not your hearts be troubled. But you know, how of our Savior, he always points us to victory, Right? As he describes the disaster that would come on the earth, he points his disciple again and again to the ultimate victory over the destruction of the work of the devil. He said, now when these things begin to happen, look up for your redemption draws nigh. Amen. Praise God. Let not your hearts be troubled. At this point that we are living in, we may have troubled, tr trouble on every hand. Even though Jesus is saying, let not your heart be troubled. There is trouble on every hand. Let me see the hands of those who don't have no form of trouble. Let me see the hands of those who don't have no form of trouble. I'm expecting no hand going up because we would be lying. We would be lying if we put our hands up. But in 1 Peter 4 verse 12, it said, Beloved, think it's not strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange things happen unto you. Have you experienced strange things? Strange things? Strange, strange things? Huh? We think of the word strange. We're thinking of what? 
unknown, don't it? Unusual, weird things, abnormal, unexpected things. In a split second, it hits you by surprise, ain't it? A sudden, listen now, a sudden notification that you are losing your job. Isn't that strange? A medical test that gives you unexpectedly bad return. Isn't that strange? The betrayal by someone you love. Isn't that strange? When things hit you by surprise, as bad as the pain can be, it is always worst when it is always worst by the element of surprise. As the scripture says, think it's not strange. It is saying that these things should not be foreign to us. We should live expecting that the same path Jesus and the apostles trod can be measured out to us. Because we are calling on the name of Jesus and as followers of Christ, we must know that the enemy is wrought with us. How do we know that the enemy is wrought with us? He will want to bring surprises in our lives. So we may ask the question when surprises come. Some of us will ask the question, why me, Lord? Why me, Lord? But why not you? Why not me? In the word of God, we can find encouragement when we are asking, why me, Lord? We can go where? We can go to the word of God and we will find what? We will find encouragement. The word of God said that the attacks of the devil may surround us. We can find peace, not ordinary peace in God's word, but a supernatural peace that only Jesus can deliver and that transcends any trials we may face. So this peace, this peace that Jesus gives to us will overcome, will, surpri will surpass any trials that we could ever face. Jesus then said, these things I have spoken to you, according to John 16, 33. These things have I spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. What did Jesus say? These things have I spoken to you, that in me you may have what? You may have peace. But what? In the world you will have what? In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Be of what? Be of good cheer. You know, I always say that if we are serving God, if we are followers of God, and we are living an easy life, we have nothing, no troubles, no trials, nothing. The devil is sleeping beside us. We need to check ourselves because the word of God said, in this world we will have what we will have tribulations we will have trials but the trials only come to make us what to make us strong we must overcome like oh jesus overcome some tests some trials that we face they are a test of character they are a test of character. For us to make it to that beautiful place, remember that sin will never raise its ugly head again. Remember where sin begin. Where did sin begin? Sin begin where? In heaven. Where, the, where God is. In heaven. Where Jesus is. In heaven. Where, the, where there was only perfection. Sin begin there. And sin will never raise its ugly head again. God caused Job to Satan's attention. So while Job and the merry way not serving God, you know, God called Job to Satan's attention, right? To say, have you considered my, 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 my servant Job? Look here. Job have no, absolutely no idea 
how his battle was going to get hot. Some of us don't even know what is awaiting us tomorrow. We don't know. We don't know, but we know who we can put our trust in, right? Say, though it is very clear that it was Satan, not God, who causes Job's suffering. Let us be clear. It was who? It was Satan, not God, who caused Job's suffering. It is clear that it is God who what? Who gives his explicit permission for Satan to do what? For Satan to destroy Job's what? Possession. To do what? Children. And even his physical health. Because Satan went back to God and said, skin to skin. Right? When, when, when Satan realized that he... he, he um, Job overcome the test. He went back to put a little more pressure on Job. But praise God. Job did nothing wrong. And Job stood through his trials. He stood firm through his trials. Children of God, if you are murmuring, if you are complaining... About a situation, something that has happened or something that is happening now, stop complaining. Stop complaining. Take a page from the book of Job. Have faith in God's promises. He promised not to leave you. He promised to be with you always, even until the end of the world. Job testimony, as my husband always said, that if the devil did know that Job testimony would have strengthened so much of us, he wouldn't, put, he wouldn't bother test him. But praise God, Job's testimony is a tower of strength to some of us who are going through trials, some of us who are going through tribulation. It is a tower of strength for us. And we know that Jesus is victorious, so we know that we will be victorious. He's saying to us today, let not your heart be troubled. Job believed in God's promises. In his, in his um, trials, he said, for I know that my Redeemer lives. Can you imagine this man? This is a man who has just lost all his children. This is a man who has just lost all his servants, all his riches, lost everything down to his skin, break out in sores. And yet still, what did he say? Yet still, yet still, what did he say? He said, he said, but he said, for I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand at the latter days upon the earth. And though, though, though what? Though my flesh, though my skins were destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. You may be going through a painful trials. You are hurting. We are emotionally or physically, I am sure that someone can testify about a painful trial. It may not be as severe like Job. These trials may come in different forms and you are tested. Praise God. I have to say praise God before I tell you this one. You are tested according to what you can manage. Do you believe it? You are tested according to what you can manage. Because my God said that he will not give you more than what you can bear. Right? And even in your trials, even in your tests, he promised that he will what? He will strengthen you. Praise God. His promises are true. His promises are true. If you don't believe me, go to Isaiah. Go to Isaiah 30, um, 43. It says, when thou pass through the water, what? I will be with you. And when you go through the what? Through the fire, he will be with you. Right? Through the what? You will not even be what? You will not even be 
burn, not if the smoke will kindle upon you. Let us take comfort in the word of God. The children of Israel passed through the Red Sea, Jordan, and the Hebrew boys passed where? Through the fire. They didn't what? They didn't even have the what? Smoke smelling on them. Praise God. No, he did not protect them from their trials, but he what? He guide them through it. Praise God. Whatever situation, whatever test you find yourself in today, remember Psalm 23. What Psalms 23 said, the Lord is my what? Is my shepherd. I shall not. He maketh me. He leadeth me. He restoreth my. He leadeth me. Praise God. Praise God. Let us take comfort in the word of God. God wants. God wants to minister through us to hurting people. This means that God may first allow us to experience uh, the same sort of hurt. Then we will be able to offer encouragement, uh, not uh, from theory, not from theory, but from our own experience uh, of the compassion and comfort of God. Praise God. According to, to Luke chapter 17, Jesus is coming again. So when you are going through your trials, know, know that these trials is to allow you to, be, to make you strong. Remember, Jesus is coming again. And how many classes of people will be unhurt when Jesus returns? How many? Two classes of people will be here when Jesus returns. So it doesn't matter, you know. It doesn't matter if you think, oh yes, I am an Adventist and I'm going to church. I'm keeping the Sabbath holy, right? Oh, it's two class of people because we are Adventists and they are Sunday worshippers. So those are the two class of people. No, 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 no. Not at all. That is not what Jesus is talking about. Two class of people. Either you are obedient to God or you're obedient to the enemy. Two classes of people. We are in church. And the Bible said the wheat and the tears will grow until the day of harvest. Which class do you want to be in? The wheat or the tear? All of us want to be wheat. In, according to Luke 7. 17. Jesus verse 34 said. I tell you. In that, there shall be what? Two men in one bed. There shall be what? Two men in one bed. It's so funny today, right? Right. Today it's so funny. Two men in one bed. Just looking at it literally, it's so funny, right? Two men in one bed. The one shall be taken. But it says sleeping in one bed. Even the sleeping make it worse. Not true. It sounds funny. Two men sleeping in one bed. One shall be taken and the other is left behind. What do people do in bed? They what? They sleep. In the Bible, sleep is referred to as what? As death. Right? Two sleeping in one bed. They're sleeping in where? Where are they sleeping? When Jesus said that I'm going to what? Lazarus sleep it. And I'm going to wake him up. Um, Martha said, Jesus, if, she, if he sleep it, that, if he sleep it, that would be good. But, but he's dead. And Jesus have to say loudly that Lazarus is dead. But I am the resurrection and the life. Though he were dead, yet shall he what? Yet shall he live. Amen. Praise God. These two types of people sleeping. What is going to happen? They are going to hear Jesus' voice. The two types of people are going to hear Jesus' voice. The two types are going to hear what? Going to hear Jesus' voice. Right? One is going to come up where? In the first resurrection. In the what? In the first resurrection. 
Right? But guess what? One come up in the first resurrection, but sadly for the next one, that is left behind. They will be sleeping another thousand years. So according to, let me not say it, according to Revelation 20, verse 5, they will what? They, the rest of, the, let, me, let me find it in my Bible. According to Revelation 20 and verse 5, <clears throat> it says, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. So the rest of the dead live not again till when? The thousand years are what? Are finished. And listen now. It says this is the first resurrection. Then the verse 6 said, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. And such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him what? A thousand years. So you see two different thousand years we're talking about? One what? One, the thousand years that we're going to, to, to be with Jesus, the dead will be what? Will be sleeping. That what? That thousand years, they don't know nothing. Right? Nothing. Uh, when we go to sleep, we don't know what is happening around us. Don't it? Until what? Until we are woke, um, wake up and sometimes we think that is our alarm clock wake us up. No, 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 no. No alarm clock can wake us up. It is who? It is God who wake us up. So, 1,000 years after, I pray we'll all be ready. I pray we'll all be ready. Not just when Jesus, for Jesus' return, but for death. Because our probation can close at any time. We may not see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory. While our eyes are open here. But we are so thankful. Because he said what? Those who are in the grave. Wherever you are. If they, if they cremate you. And your dust, your ashes show on the sea. You will come what? You will come back together. When you hear the voice of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Then Jesus spoke again about the two women who shall be grinding together. Right? The one shall be taken and the other is left. Right here, Jesus is talking about evangelism where there are two kinds of people again sharing the gospel sharing the good news of salvation. One must be true and one must be false. One must be what? One must be true and one must be false. Then he spoke again about two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left behind. In St. Matthew 13 verse 38 he said, the field is the world. Right? The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tears are the children of the wicked ones. So here again, there are two types of missionaries in the field. The true and the false. We want to be what? We want to be on the side of? We want to be on the side of truth. Because if we are not on the side of truth, according to Matthew 7 verse 22, it's many will say to him in that day, Lord, 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 I, we have not, we have prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful work. We're going to boast on our work, right? That we have done this, we have done that. In your name, Lord, we did it in your name. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. None of us inside here would like to hear those words. None of us would like to hear those words. I never knew you. Praise God. And not only I don't knew you, you know, 23 said, and then will I profess unto them, I, I never knew you. Depart from me. He workers, he workers of iniquity. So it's not just he's going to say, I never knew you. Depart. 
some of us skin up our face about iniquity, but uh, we are going to be considered if we have not, or if we are not doing what we are supposed to do. When we hear these words, we are going to be classified with iniquity workers. We are going to be classified with fornicators. We are going to classify with same sex, the LGBT, whatever we skin up our face over, we are going to be classified with them. Family, let us be ready. Let us be ready. Revelation 22 verse 12 said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. He promised us. Uh, he said, I'm going, and I'm coming again. Don't it? In St. John 14 verse 1 to 3, he said, I'm going, and I'm coming again. And now he's telling us in Revelation 22 verse 12, that my reward is with me to pay every man according as his work shall be. It means that we are living in a world, and whatever we are doing, we are working. Whether we are working for God, or we are working for the enemy. Right? So Jesus is coming to pay us. I pray we are in the right group for us to be in the right group. We need daily to overcome the surprises in our, in our, life, in our trials. God promised us, family. God promised us. In Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 26. You know, family, we don't need to worry. Can I just sip a little bit of the water? We don't need to worry, family. We don't need to worry. God promised us. You know that God do everything that he can for us to be saved? What a, what a loving God. We don't know what love is, you know? We always say we love, we love, we love. And just one bad thing, we don't bother love again. You know how we prove that? When we go to the altar and we said for better or for worst, in sickness and in health, uh -huh. what, what the other part? I don't remember the next part. Till death do us part, right? And uh, you know, when faults come, that love gone. Hmm? Hmm? But God said to us in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put into you. And I will take away that stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. God promised us a new heart and a new spirit. When Jesus speaks of the new heart, he means the mind, the life, the whole being. For us to have a change of heart, it is to withdraw the affection or affection from the things of the world and fasten them on Christ. In Romans chapter 12 verse 2 it said, The Lord said, And be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your what? Of your mind, that ye may prove that uh, what is that good uh, and acceptable will uh, of God? Uh, my family, our mind uh, must be renewed. Uh, new minds, new purpose, new motives. Uh, family, the sign of a new heart is a changed life. Uh, there is a daily, there's an hourly Dying to selfishness and pride. When our hearts are renewed, forgiveness will be easy. Selfishness will reduce. There will be no malice. And it will be easy to apologize if you have hurt a brother or a friend. A renewed heart uh, does not accuse the person who hurt us. Uh, but, uh, but look beyond uh, 
that person and see the enemy, Satan, trying to get to them. Therefore, a person who has a renewed heart will be happy to make it right with a brother, with a sister, with a friend, or with your leader. Even when your leaders are very hard at you, you will what? You will make it right with them. Is her heart renewed? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. Let us be sober. Let us be vigilant because our adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Do you believe that? Why do you think there are two classes of people? Even as we are looking at Jesus' return, even as we have looked at the promise that Jesus said, I'm coming again, there are persons who have different concept of how Jesus will return. The enemy of soul may devour, may devour us by allowing us to put our own interpretation to scripture. But let us search the word of God. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. We know that Jesus is coming back. So we must search to find the truth. One witness, two witness, three witnesses. Ain't it in the word of God? Can we find these? Sure, on every point that we take it. Jesus is coming back. Just as how his disciples see him leave. But somehow, sometime you're here, or you will hear, and Jesus tell you that you will hear, you know, my Jesus don't leave anything unturned. No, he, he told us, he said that you will hear, if you hear that I am in the desert, you should not what? You should not go. So it means that person is going to impersonate his coming to say that he's in the desert or he's here or he's there. Let us remember that we will not what? We will not go and we will encourage others of how he will what? How he will return. He's in Acts chapter 1 verse 9 to 11 it said, Jesus was taken up and a cloud received him out of the sight of his disciple. Right? So the disciples were worried. Can you imagine? Can you imagine your teacher, your master, taking up how you're gazing into heaven? Right? So they were gazing. They were looking up. And two men stood by them in white apparel. Right? We would say those are angels. Right? And they said to them, E men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This, this, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in what? In what? In like manner as he has seen him go into heaven. So we don't need to believe when we heard that Jesus is coming and he's over there and he's over there. In like what? In like manner. So what? So every eyes will what? We'll see him. There are so many theories out there. I'm not here to talk about those theories this morning, right? Every high school what in the bank when they are teaching them the money, they don't teach them the false one. They look at the what? The, the, the good one, right? Okay, so we are looking now at the word of God and it says that Jesus will return in the same manner in which the disciples see him go into heaven. Right? And he's coming back. And there's a theory said that he's coming back like a thief in the night. Right? He's coming back like a thief in the night. And so the theory of this, this secret rapture coming. But Jesus said, as the lightning flashes from there unto the west, so shall the Son of Man come. Right? And then in Thessalonians, it says that what? 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 What did it say? It says that the Lord himself, what? What now? What now? 
The Lord himself will descend from what? From heaven. With a what? With a shout. With the voice of the what? Of the archangel. The shout will be so loud that what? That the dead in Christ will raise. Is there anything secret about that? Is there anything silent about that? No. No. But as I said, that the separation comes with the interpretation of the word of God. Right? So some person see and it says that I will come what? As a thief in the night. And they stop right there. Jesus is coming like a thief. Yes, Jesus is coming like a thief in the night. How does a thief come when you don't expect him? Don't it? You you set watchman over and over again to look out for the thief. But guess what? The thief study you too, right? And when the watchman is not looking, that's the time the thief come. So Jesus will come as a thief in the night to some to the class of people that is not what that is not prepared, right? That is not prepared. And he will also come as a thief to all of us. Because we no man, no boy, no girl, nor the what, nor the day, nor the hour when Jesus will put in his appearance. Praise God. There's just one more point I need to just address before I sit down. Because I used to think about this too. You know, there's a theory, family, that says, and this is just reminder for, reminders for us as Adventists. I wish somebody out there could be hearing how they're hearing who don't know. There's a theory that says that when Jesus return, we'll have seven years, right? And I normally said, because I must tell you that I'm not, I'm a born Adventist. I basically grew up in the New Testament church. So I know this theory, right? Uh, it says that, huh, and my sisters always said, if I don't make it in the rapture, I'm going to make it in the tribulation. I'm going to make it in the tribulation, right? So we're, so we're saying that. The theory says that not. We are saying, come on, come on, Sister Claudia, not we are saying. The theory say, is that um, when Jesus returned, and the saints are ruptured, then you will have seven years to what? To make it through the tribulation. I normally said, boy, if they pluck out my fingernail, my toenails, and all of that, I am not giving up. I'm going to make it through the tribulation if I don't make it through the rupture. You know, and I believe that. And the reason why I touch this point is because I believed it. Right? But guess what? Guess what? The tribulation upon when? Upon now. While we are alive, it happens what now? Because when Jesus shall return, he said, Behold, I come quickly. And what? And my reward is with me to pay every man according as his work shall be. There will be no second chance. You must be ready now. There will be no tribulation. When Jesus returns, it is a lie from the pit of hell. If we look at the Bible, if we look, if we look at some stories in the Bible, Noah was saved through the flood, not from it, right? Um, if we go again, Job was saved through his crisis. Did God take Job out of the tribulation? No, Job was saved through his crisis. Joseph was not saved from being sold into slavery, but God saved him through it. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. We don't, if we are lost, if we are considered wicked, then we have nobody to blame but ourselves. Nobody to blame but ourselves. Daniel was saved through what? Through the what? Through the lions then. The three Hebrew boys that I mentioned before was saved through the what? Through the fire. The children of Israel were not saved from Egypt before the plagues. Wow. All of those plagues, they fell when the children of Israel were what? Were in Egypt. And God did what? God did protect them. God said what? Kill a lamb and put what? And put the blood over your doorpost. And when I see the blood, when what? When I see the blood, I will pass over you. We are protected. We are covered under the blood of Jesus. 
Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. In closing, in closing, family, let us remember the word of the Lord. It says, I go to prepare a place for you. And I, I, this same Jesus will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Let us, let us remember that we must go through some form of what? Some form of trials. When we are going through trials, family, let us remember the promises. You know, this song always come to my mind. From I was a teenager going to Sunday church, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel comfortable. I can't feel at home. I must not feel at home. We must not feel at home. We must never feel at home in this world that we are living in. Whenever time we feel at home in this world, we are drawn to the world. And Jesus said when he prayed for us in St. John chapter 17, he said, I pray that you will not take them out of this world, but that you will sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Praise God. So while traveling through this world of sorrow, let us put our minds to where? To glory land. And the songwriter said, I will not turn back for some sweet day, day my trials here. I will understand. I want to know more about my Jesus. I want to know more about my Lord. I want to know more about that mansion. He has got to what? To prepare for me. Family, let us keep the faith. Let us keep the faith. Whatever we are doing, whatever we may have in our lives that would cause us to lose out on this mansion that God has gone to prepare for us. Let us, by the grace of God, ask him for help. He will help us. He will help us. He said to us, he said, you as evil parents, you as earthly parents, you know how to give good gifts to your children. Huh? How much more will I not give you the Holy Spirit if you ask of me? And then he said, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be open unto you. He didn't stop there. He said, whosoever asks it, I will give. And if you ask for a, a stone, something like that, I will not give you a serpent. What a mighty God we serve. He went on to say, family, he said, I will sprinkle clean water upon you. I will sprinkle clean water upon you so that you shall be what? You shall be clean. What a mighty God we serve. He has done everything and he's doing everything for us to be saved. The only thing that is blocking us from being saved is ourselves. Is ourselves. We all have choices to make. We all have to make our own choices. Force love is no love at all. Right? Force love is no love at all. And so we have, as we say, two classes of people in the world. It's two choices, right? One, God, or the other, the enemy, which is the devil. If you are in between, if you are on neutral, right? You know the car, you put it on neutral so it can run back or front, right? If you're on neutral, then who's ground your hand? The devil ground, right? If you are neutral, you are on the devil ground. So don't think that, oh yes, I am good, and I'm this, and I'm that. And at the same time, you have some darling sins that you are covering up. You are on the devil's side. So let us, by God's grace today, ask him 
to come into our hearts, to come into our life, to cleanse us. You remember Isaiah? You remember Isaiah? It says in the year that what? King Isaiah died. I saw, I also saw the Lord high and lifted up and his trail filled the temple. And when Isaiah saw it, Isaiah said, Whoa, am I? I'm sinful. I am undone. The songwriter said, the closer you get, the closer you get, the more you see the glory. The closer you get to God, the more you will feel unworthy. The more you will feel undone. Let us, by God's grace, family, let us, by God's grace, make it in to that place that God has gone to prepare for us. God bless you. Good afternoon, saints of God. It's a great privilege for us to sit here and to listen to this sermon. It is so wonderful. It is so refreshing. We have to just give God thanks. Our closing hymn is 200. I, I can't sing, but it is sing to. Let me let me try. The Lord is coming. Let this be the herald note of jubilee. And when <laughs> shall we all stand? The Lord is coming, let this be the herald notes of jubilee. And when we meet and when we part, the salutation from our heart. The Lord is coming, let this be the herald notes of jubilee. The anybody inside here who have not given their life to the Lord. You know, it is two choice. Either you are on God's side or you are on the enemy's side. 
Remember, you don't know what the next minute of your life will be. You don't know if when you leave outside, you don't know if this is your last opportunity. And I'm not saying this to frighten anybody. So at this time, could you walk to the altar for prayer? Okay, the second call is for us. Are we ready? Suppose Jesus should put in his appearance right now. Suppose uh, we hear the sound of the trumpet. Are we ready? If we can say, yes, we are ready, sit in your seat. If not, join me at the altar. Let us pray. The Lord is coming, let this be the herald note of Jubilee, the herald note of Jubilee. Our God and our Father, King of kings and Lord of all, conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. You are God and there is no one else like you. You are Alpha, you are Omega, you are the beginning and the end. There is none like you, Father. And because of that, we come at this moment bowing before you. We have listened to your words, my God. We have listened. You have been warning us over and over and over again. Sometimes the same messages come back weeks after weeks, months after months, year after year, oh God, because you have loved us so much. We come before you at this moment. Father, we don't know. We are not sure. We are not certain that if the trumpet should sound now, we are not certain that if our name is called in the judgment now, that we will be saved. There may be some little things in our lives, Father, that we need to surrender. We ask at this moment, oh God, that you will turn your searchlight into our hearts, Lord. Search us. Send your Holy Spirit to search our thoughts, search our hearts, Lord. See if there's anything in us that is unlike you. I'm asking Almighty God that you will... Allow your Holy Spirit to prick our conscience one more time so that we will surrender totally to you. And so, Lord, we will be ready. As a songwriter penned the song, Father, we want to be ready to leave this world. I am ready, waiting to leave this world. We want to be in a state of readiness. We want to say like Paul, a fight, a good fight when looking at our lives we want to say like Job I know that my redeemer live and I will, he will stand with me on that day Father we ask for your divine protection around us we ask mighty God that you Father will help us to live a life that is pleasing in your sight Father if there is anyone in the hearing of my voice today who have not given their hearts to you if they are in this congregation and they didn't walk, it is a reason why they are here today. You promise, Lord, that your words will not return unto you void, but it will accomplish into that which it was made to be accomplished. And so at this moment, Lord, let your words be accomplished into the heart of your people. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. We give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. We thank you also for answering this, our prayers. We thank you also for bringing whatever is in our life that will stop us from seeing you, that will stop us from being in that new Jerusalem, that you have removed them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.
Dismiss us, Lord, with blessings we pray, as from thy worship we go. Four one.